So this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about agroecology, but first I'd like to introduce you to Nem Sorendri. She's a Cambodian farmer. After seven years of training with a Cambodian NGO CDAC, she's been winning the annual rice yielding competition. So her photo graces the cover of Pan's new book on agroecology, on replacing pesticides with agroecology. So what is agroecology? It's, uh, the, it's the application of ecological concepts to the design and management of sustainable agroecosystems. It's about linking ecology, culture, economics and society to sustainable agriculture, to healthy environments and viable farming communities. It involves science, involves practices on the farm, it involves also a movement because it includes, most importantly, food sovereignty the right of farmers and communities to determine their own, uh, and to, uh, to control and determine their own food supply and their own production systems. This is an important part of agroecology. Agroecology um, has been around for quite a long time in, in, in terms of a, of a term. It was first introduced in 1928 by a Czech agronomist, um, but not much further taken forward until after Rachel Carson produced Silent Spring in 1962 and her, her famous book which drew attention to the impact of pesticides on ecosystems. And then people been, began to make the connection between agriculture, pesticides and ecosystems. And so from 1962 onwards, researchers, farmers, advocates and academics and activists, particularly in Latin and North America, developed the concept of agroecology and took it further forward. And now the entire UN system is being urged to adopt agroecology as the primary approach to agriculture, production, food security and food sovereignty internationally. In 2009, the IISTD, International Agricultural um, Science and Technology for Development, started to propel it onto the international stage. And then in 2011, Oliver de Schutter, the UN Special Rapporteur on the World Right to Food, really brought it to prominence with his reports to the UN uh, Human Rights Council on how agroecology could help feed the entire world, but particularly those people who are living in, in marginal circumstances whose production is low and who don't have access to expensive inputs. We were very instrumental in 2013 in bringing the um, issue to the Stockholm Convention, a UN chemicals convention that doesn't normally deal with things like agroecology. It deals with uh, chemicals that are persistent pollutants, toxic and accumulating in the environment and that are banned globally. When they chose to list um, the insecticide or endosulfin for a global ban, they also recommended that endosulfin be approached with ecosystem approach uh, um, approaches to pest management. And this was really the work of PAN in bringing this forward to this point. In 2014, as a result of a lot of pressure from PAN and its allies and academics and farmers around the world, FAO held its first international symposium on, on agroecology, a big step forward. But then again last year in 2015, PAN was very instrumental with its partner organisations in getting the um, the, uh, the International Chemicals Management uh, Conference in, uh, in uh, 2015 to, to adopt agroecology practices as a, as a means of phasing out highly hazardous pesticides. For a long time countries have expressed concern about highly hazardous pesticides but it was recognised at this point that instead of replacing one with another one, agroecology is the way forward. So in producing the book for PAN on agroecology, um, I had to read through an enormous number of writings on agroecology. Much has been written by many different organisations and many different peoples, and they're all slightly different. So what we did was to distill what we'd found in these, in these writings into seven core principles, which reflected in a number of agroecological practices. The exact practices a farmer uses depends very much on the context of their farm, on their geography, on the geology of their soils, also on the social conditions under which they're working. So unlike chemical agriculture where you just plug in a simple chemical for a simple pest and hope for the best, there is no prescribed recipe. You have to work with the farmers, with their conditions, with what's at hand in order to make agroecology work. Agroecology, I, I get asked where, where does organic agriculture fit with this, what about IPM? Agroecological practices underlie organics, some forms of IPM, those that actually work with the environment, permaculture, some forms of traditional agriculture, but not all. Um, but 
while all of these systems use eco agroecological practices, it's really only agroecology that brings forward the social and cultural aspects of food production and food security, which are actually really critical to the survival of rural communities, and all communities in fact. And so these are really pronounced on agroecology. Because agroecology encourages the development of resilience and a maintenance of healthy agro, uh, uh, ecosystems instead of reliance on external inputs, it supports this multi-dimensional approach to agriculture. Not only food and jobs being produced, not only economic well-being, but it nurtures cultural and social, um, uh, and social aspects and brings environmental benefits. I don't normally quote uh, ministers of the government in my, in my talks, but I think this one from Stéphane Le Foll, the French Minister for, the, uh, for Agriculture, is actually really adds something to the debate on agroecology. Above all, I think agroecology is a mindset, a desire to do better, and a form of optimism and trust in both our natural resources and our intelligence as human beings. Agroecology is an investment in the future. It also provides a means of meeting the needs of society as a whole, in other words, it's placing agroecology not just as a farming practice there on the fields, but as a central part of our society. So in compiling the book for PAN, uh, we, we looked at a number of different case studies around the world, and uh, we found that in all of them, yields across whole farms, i.e. not just one crop, but the yields across the whole farm always increase. Sometimes the yields of one major crop would increase, Sometimes the yield of the major crop would slightly decrease, but the whole farm would, a whole farm output would increase. Inevitably also the profitability increased and always the pesticide use decreased, often to none, to zero. Some, many of the farms are using zero pesticides. And in each of the cases also we found that food security and food sovereignty increased when farms had shifted from using pesticides to applying agroecological principles. We found that in all cases, resilience to climate change was improved, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute. That empowerment of women was improved. That farmer and community cooperation was imp improved. It's a, it's a key aspect of agroecology. Farmers working together to assist each other and working through communities. And of course, with all of those came also reduced suicides, which has been a feature of, of uh, a number of um, areas in the world where pesticides are heavily used, most particularly in the cotton belt and, and, and Punjab, Punjab of India, also improved health and better environmental uh, outcomes for these, in these farms. I said I'd mention climate resilience again. I, fi I think this photo is a rather striking photo. It's a, it's a woman farmer in Vietnam. On the left, she's holding a rice plant grown using agroecological techniques, and on the right, exactly the same variety grown using standard chemical-based techniques. And you can see the incredible difference in the yield of those plants. And then behind her, and this is where the climate bit comes in, behind her, the field on the left is grown using agroecology, that's the, where the plants came from, but the one on the right has lodged because a typhoon came through. And you can see that the agroecological field stood up to the typhoon, didn't lodge, and the harvest is saved. Uh, there, are, there are numerous um, examples of, of um, climate resilience with agroecology, but to me this is one of the most striking examples. So now I'm going to briefly go through the principles that I mentioned uh, and, and explain a little bit more about them. So the first principle of agroecology is that you grow according to your environment, you adapt according to what your environment offers you. Here you can see contour planting in Costa Rica, which is on a very steep hillside. Um, but you have, it's important that you harmonise the farm with the environment, that you choose plants that are suitable to your location and that you use locally adapted seeds. Now this would seem common sense to most people, but this is not how most farms are organised. Most farms around the world think they will grow something and they go out and find what's the, currently the cheapest seeds or the best the seeds that have been promoted and they plant them or the livestock that's on the market and they put it in without any due regard for what their actual farming system can best support. Um, for example, GE seeds that are being uh, uh, um, bred in one part of the world and then spread around the whole world for use, they're not adapted locally. They don't do as well in local conditions as the locally adapted seeds do. So this is the, probably the, one of the most crucial parts of um, agroecology. This slide is actually my own farm on Waiheke Island in New Zealand and it demonstrates rather a number, a number of important aspects of the second principle which is a need to provide 
favorable soil conditions. So after our crops come out in, in uh, late uh, autumn, we, we plant these, uh, the, the garden's beds in uh, blue lupins, which is a nitrogen fixing, fixing legume. So it's fixing nitrogen into the soil, it's also keeping the soil covered. Then in spring we cut it down, we cut it up, and we leave it on the surface, cover it with compost. So the, root, the nitrogen fixing nodules in the plant are still attached to the roots, they're still in the soil, they're providing nitrogen to the soil. We haven't disturbed the soil, so the microorganisms are still doing their work. And we just plant, in this case, we planted tomato plants right through the middle of them. Um, so minimum disturbance of soil, no tillage was going on, maximum increase in, green, uh, in, in organic matter in the soil. Um, and we did get a very powerful crop of tomatoes off that. The nitrogen gave the plants a very good boost to start with and they came away and by the time the nitrogen was no longer needed because the fruit were forming and we needed other minerals, uh, the nitrogen supply in the soil had exhausted. But that's a perfect example of how, um, how agroecology works. We didn't need to pro provide any nitrogen to the soil, the plants did it for us. And we didn't need to till, till the soil either because the, the, the microorganisms and the earthworms were doing that for us as well. So the third um, important aspect of agroecology is about diversifying species and genetic resources. And, and here we see photos of uh, coffee interplanted with bananas and legumes in Central America on the left hand side and then lower down intercropping of organic oats with lentils in Europe. There's a number of reasons, there's a number of ways of doing, of, of, of diversifying species. Agroforestry is another way. Crop rotations, you provide one crop one season, another crop the next season, another crop the season after. All of those create a diversity um, in the agricultural system, which helps to, in a number of ways, it helps to reduce pest pressures. It helps to, um, especially in this agroforestry agro system, we've got a number of plants, they can shade each other, they can provide nutrients to each other. So there's a whole range of benefits that uh, diversifying species can produce. Not least is if, one, if, if you have a, one crop and it gets a pest, disease, a pest attack or a disease attack, you lose the crop, you lose your whole income, you lose your whole livelihood. But if you've got a whole variety of species growing, one gets affected, the others don't, you still have, you still have income sources to keep you going. Enhancing beneficial biological interactions is an is a incredibly important way, means for reducing the use of pesticides. And here we see a dragonfly eating a, a rice pest in India. So, so the biological interactions can help to prevent the pests and diseases building up in the first place. You can also help to augment what is naturally there by adding in biological controls when you do have a pest problem. Um, you can also uh, en enhance beneficial biological interactions by timing when you plant things. If you plant, um, if you, for example, you till your soil before you plant, sow your seeds, wait a little bit, the seed weeds come up, till it again, you get rid of the weeds, plant then, you've avoided a huge problem with weeds. In, in other countries, if you plant according to um, a calendar, you might find that the rains are not going to fit exactly when they're most needed with your crop production. We found this in, in crops in Africa. If they delayed their planting by a couple of weeks, they could actually time the most important stage of growth with the best rainfall. So those are, those are techniques that are not usually uh, uh, acknowledged by calendar, calendar planting, calendar spraying, calendar growing, uh, conventional agriculture, but are also very, but are very important parts of agroecology. Minimising use and loss of water and energy, straw mulches in, field, in a rice field in Cambodia, this is just one way of, of uh, minimising water and energy usage. You mulch, um, as I said before in the previous slide, keeping the soil surface covered at all times is really important. But there's also uh, important methods of water harvesting and, ir and, and irrigating to conserve water. Uh, renew, using renewable energy sources and using local sources and resources instead of resources that come from another part of the planet. All of these things go towards conserving energy on a global scale as well as just on the local farm. And, and in terms of agroecology, we are looking at the global scale as well as just the local farm situation. Minimising use of non-renewable external resources. Um, there's a chap here holding a homemade coffee berry borer trap made from a soft drink bottle. Uh, and th this has been used successfully to replace the now globally banned organochlorine insecticide endosulfan. Uh, and it's been proved to be very effective. It costs very little, if, if anything at all. I suppose once someone's drunk the soft drink, there's the bottles free. 
um, and it's been incredibly effective. And on the right hand side we see um, learning rice breeding techniques in the Philippines and this again comes, I mentioned before, uh, using local varieties. Um, Farmers who can breed their own seeds and breed good, 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 breeds, uh, good varieties of their own seeds save an enormous amount of, of, of money uh, through not having to buy patented seeds on the market, ge genetically modified seeds, as well as being able to adapt their, um, their planting to their, their varieties to their own specific needs. And lastly, maximising the use of farmers' knowledge and skills. And this is an incredibly important part of agroecology, which is again not widely recognised in IPM or to an extent in IPM, but in, in, in conventional agriculture. This is a photo of a trainee, recently held training in India, um, of training on agroecology and sustainable livelihood. Um, it's important that farmers, working with farmers' local knowledge and skills, they are the ones that know what the system is like. They are the ones who can tell how, how the climate is changing things. They are the ones who have the traditional knowledge and working with those traditional knowledges, enhancing those traditional systems is, is an important part of empowering farmers uh, through agroecology. So all of these principles and practices that I've talked about maximise farmers and communities con control over their own farms and their own food supply, at the same time providing enough healthy food to feed the whole planet without destroying the environment. And I emphasise they provide enough healthy food to feed the whole planet. There is an abundance of evidence that all our farming, all our food supply was done through agroecological production on smallholder farms, there would be more than enough food to feed the entire world. Thank you. I'll leave you with a photo of a bird, hopefully waiting for a pest in an agroecological field. You talked about the pest control um, or pest management. How does um, agroecology actually uh, controls pest without chemicals? Okay, so the, the most important part of agroecology in, in terms of its pest management is creating a, a, a diverse and harmonised environment that actually um, allows the beneficial insects which can control pest insects to flourish. When you, sp when you apply a pesticide to a crop, more often than not, that pesticide will kill the beneficial insects as well as the, as the pests. So you're uh, uh, immediately wiping out the best, aspect, the best part of your farm for controlling pests. With agroecology uh, and, and with organics and IPM, all of those systems, you do not use a pesticide, whether it's a biological pesticide or a, a botanical pesticide or a chemical pesticide, unless it's absolutely essential, it's the last option. So you're working with your environment to create conditions that, that, um, that uh, diminish the pressure from pests, that pests don't like, that, that, that don't encourage pests and diseases, but at the same time they foster the, um, the development of populations of beneficial insects, which can then also kill the pests when they do arise. Agroecology is really very impressive how to control pests and more food production. And I would like to know this more food production, how much this is going to help the agricultural laborers, women farmers who are landless. One of the as I mentioned, one of the key aspects of agroecology is working with social and cultural conditions. So many of the projects around the world um, that are working with agroecology have taken um, a, a very specific focus on working with landless people and with women farmers to ensure that their rights are being met, that their rights to land, their rights to resources are being met. So these are very clearly fostered within agroecology. It doesn't come as an automatic given that when you have agroecology you will also have rights for everybody. We still have to work for rights for women, for rights for landless farmers, rights for, for farm workers. Um, but there's a better chance of achieving those rights within an agroecological agro framework than there is within a, uh, a chemical dependent contract farming framework that predominates now. I'm 
Uh, Meryl, that was a very interesting presentation. Now, in terms of making agroecology uh, something that uh, nations, countries can use, in terms of uh, uh, coming up with good policies, do you have any example of countries or some ideas how countries can embrace agroecology? Well, actually, um, one of the countries that's been progressive in this area is France, hence the reason that I quoted as Minister. France actually has a policy that says uh, a certain percent of our farms will be agroecologically agro um, practiced by a certain time. I'm sorry, I can't remember the figures. Um, there are other countries like Ecuador who have it written into their constitution that their, farm, their farming should be agroecological. So things are changing. Uh, there's a long way to go, but some countries are starting to gradually write it into their, uh, into their um, constitutions and their policies. And it's actually really, really important that we do work with the international community and the national community and regional organisations to get countries, to get governments to understand that their country will be better off economically, their people will be better off, there'll be less poverty, less malnutrition, if they follow that example and write into their policies that their country should be practicing agroecology and then work with farmers and NGOs to make that happen on the field, to stop supporting the, the chemical dependent farming, to stop supporting the chemical industry and start working on behalf of the farmers and with the farmers because the farmers are the ones who really gain under agroecology and so we need to have the governments working with farmers instead of against them. My question is that uh, we are campaigning to our governments to bring into the constitution on food sovereignty. Uh, how about, uh, how do we differentiate this? Can we take up agroecology first and then the long term as food sovereignty? I think we should take both agroecology and food sovereignty together. They are like partners, they belong together. You can't have food sovereignty if you don't have agroecology. We will never get food sovereignty with chemical agriculture. Uh, we will never get food sovereignty with commercially driven, export driven agriculture. This, this kind of agriculture works against the people. But if you have agroecology, you will almost automatically develop a, degree of food, a strong degree of food sovereignty. So the two must come together. Dr. Maria and curious about how we can uh, simplify the information to disseminate the information awareness about the agroecology to the public, to the uh, consumers. Simplifying it is, um, it's not so hard. I think the problem at the moment is that people are not really familiar with the term agroecology. And when they become familiar with it, and you start to real, and they start to realise that agroecology agri means agriculture and ecology, the ecosystem, and it, then you can very easily get people to understand the concept that the ecosystem, agriculture's got to work in harmony with the environment. That's the basic principle of agroecology, is working in harmony with the environment and with farmers and communities. That's the simplest message of all. Uh, on, on a kind of agroecology agro approach, will it be cheaper for the farmers because you're playing with around So in terms of cash economy, the farmer will be able to keep more money or what is your experience? The experience that we found in, in writing the book was that in, many, uh, in most, almost all cases, in fact all cases, the farmers' costs were less using agroecology because they don't have to buy expensive pesticides. They're using local resources that cost them little. They're using, often they're using more labour, but that's usually family labour or, or even when it's not, it's, they're still, their costs are still lo lower. So uh, one of the great things about this is it takes the farmers out of that debt spiral. That debt spiral that's caused the suicides of so many farmers, millions of farmers worldwide, and particularly in India. Um, and so agroecology has broken that cycle for the farmers who are using it. It's, it's been a tremendous, tremendous um, plus. Shower. Well, would it be a good idea to ask uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization to change its name to the Food and Agroecology <laughs> Organization? 
<laughs> Food and Agriculture Organisation, that's a very good name. I, I like that. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> I have a question on uh, how agroecology actually um, contributes to climate resilience. Um, what okay. you know? How does that uh, really yeah. make sense to actually talk about yeah. agroecology in terms of climate resilience? So, so there's a numbers of why it contributes to a, a, um, climate resilience. One is that you are producing healthier plants, stronger plants, especially if you're using locally adapted seeds, and that's what the photo of the the, the Cambodian farmer. A Vietnamese farmer showed um, the strong healthy plants that can withstand the weather. Um, another aspect of agroecology is the diversified plantings and they found in, in Central America when a, a, a typhoon went through or a hurricane went through that the monocultural crops were just wiped out by the hurricane but where they had agroforestry, where they had a range of different heights of trees and crops growing, they that not so much was lost and what was lost recovered much more quickly. So there's there's those kinds of issues. Agroecology is for building up better, stronger soils, healthier soils with more organic matter. So it's better able to withstand both droughts and flooding. So there's a whole range of ways in which it can contribute to re climate resilience. And it also contributes to reducing climate change effects um, by incorporating organic matter into the soil. You're in incorporating carbon into the soil. You're reducing the carbon load in the atmosphere. So it works both ways, in fact. Yeah, I think it would be useful to know the difference between organic farming and agroecological farming because people are more familiar with the term organic farming. Uh, is there such a thing as agroecological standards as no. in organic farming? You know, that, that's, that's one of the differences, the organic standards. In fact, the fa our farm that I showed you on Waiheke is certified organic, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's one of the farms that could be called either agroecological or certified organic. But not all certified organic farms can, particularly in industrialised countries like the US and New Zealand, where you have large-scale monocultural cro cropping of, a, of one organic crop. That is not agroecology. That is certified organics, meaning that it's met a certain standard for um, how you uh, not not using pesticides, not using genetic GM uh, organisms, uh, and there's a number of other things in the standards about how you manage your soil. So they're certainly a whole lot better than um, a chemically uh, chemically run farm, but it's not necessarily the same as organics. So this is very much depends on the country we're talking about. Many of the many of the um, organic farms in uh, Asia are ecological agroecological farms. It's more an issue in the developing country where you have the, the sometimes sharp divide between organics and agroecology on big farms, but not necessarily on small farms. And agroecology has no set of defined rules that you must meet. There's no standards that you have to meet. There's no one to certify you as to meeting those standards. So it's a lot easier in that respect for farmers to, to practice uh, agroecology. On the other hand, um, certified organic farmers usually get a premium in the market for their product because there's a guarantee to the consumer that your product has, got, has, has not had chemicals used in its, in its growing, in its production. Agroecology doesn't have that kind of backup, so it doesn't necessarily ex, um, get the same kind of premium for farmers in the market. Uh, and consumers um, don't ha have a brand, uh, don't have a, a standard that they can necessarily trust. But when we're talking about small villages and within the village, villagers know what's going on. They can they know what to, they can trust their own food supply. Um, so the organic standard is really an important thing when your food is going to a further destination away from where it's grown. Agroecology is much more focused on growing within the uh, within the community. Although the product from ag agroecology is also exported around the world. I hope that helps a little bit. <laughs> Agroecology is a challenge to the Global Alliance, which is trying to promote climate smart agriculture. Do you yes. agree with this? Yes, I do. The Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance has um, it really is business as usual with the name climate in front of it and I'm not sure where the smart bit comes into it because it's still based on using external inputs, chemicals, fertilizers, GM products. We'll have some smarter GM products that are more that are more resistant to drought. Actually traditional seeds got there first. Traditional a lot of traditional seeds are much more resilient to drought than anything that's being produced by the by the, the, the seed corporations. So 
uh, climate smart agriculture is unfortunately a real diversion away, distraction from what we really need to be doing. Uh, we can talk about climate resilient agriculture as an alternative, but what underlies that is agroecology, and agroecology is what we need to talk about. If climate smart agriculture ever starts to use agroecology instead of chemicals, fertilizers, and GM techniques to, to deal with climate, then that would be a good thing. But so far, it's not smart enough to do that. Uh, the uh, basic condition for uh, agroecology to be practiced is the the biodiversity yes. is maintained. Yes. The, how is the UN organization like uh, the uh, IUCN is looking at this uh, uh, the biodiversity uh, the uh, this uh, agro ecological uh, the agriculture. To be honest, I'm not sure to the extent to which IUCN has taken up agroecology. They, they really need to, but whether they have already, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. My last question is that it sounds and looks very much like the traditional farming that involvement of more farmers and their own decision making on their own seeds and then the temperature and the season and all that. Uh, Agroecology is more or less uh, except the monoculture, almost the same like uh, traditional farming. Agro agriculture, uh, agroecology is based in traditional farming. Um, but it's more than that. It's also the application of modern, um, modern methods, for example, of biological control um, that are introduced as well. So um, some forms of traditional farming actually are not agroecological. And I think, for example, of the slash and burn farming, where you cut the forest, you planted a crop for a year, and then you moved on and you've left behind a devastated environment. That's not really agroecological. It served those people in those occasions, but it left behind a damaged environment. Agroecology doesn't leave behind a damaged environment. So not all traditional um, practices were necessarily good. Many were, many still are. But agroecology and the, and the modern approach to agroecology can actually help to enhance those. It helped farmers to um, see how they can better improve the organic matter in their soils, how they can better foster the beneficial relationships with, with um, uh, with uh, beneficial organisms and, and pests and diseases. So there is a lot that science, modern science, can do to assist farmers practicing agroecology agro and practicing traditional farming without there necessarily having to be expensive inputs. We're so used to farming, uh, to agricultural science, producing expensive inputs for farmers. That's not what, how it needs to be. Agroecological science can provide really good backup for traditional farming and subsistence farming and smallholder farming without involving them in any kind of uh, external inputs. Um, so that's the real benefit of agroecology. Well, that's the science part of agroecology. How would, how would women benefit from agroecology? One of the ways that women are benefiting from agroecology is, is, is that um, an understanding of the necessity to work together. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's not an automatic given that if you have agroecology, therefore you have justice and empowerment for all women. But wherever agroecology is being, um, is being uh, developed in countries, there has always been a very, there's always a very strong component of helping women to uh, become empowered to, to and, and, and in fact, um, what the experience has been is that women have gained a whole lot more from agroecology than men have. It's they've managed to leapfrog through the positions they've been in, through bypassing the chemical farming into some really good uh, agroecology farming. It's producing very nutrient-rich food. So this is another way in which women are um, empower, uh, 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 assisted. The food that's coming from agroecology and from organic agriculture is generally more nutrient-dense. It has a richer supply of nutrients in it, which really assists women who have 
uh, for example, greater need for micronutrients during pregnancy in, to, in order to avoid anemia, which can be life-threatening. Um, so the food that's coming from these agricultural systems is healthier, not only because it doesn't have the pesticides in it, but because it has better nutritional qualities. So there, there are many ways in which um, women have benefited. There are, spinning off from agroecology, there's been a lot of development of small micro-enterprises. For example, I can think of some villages in India where women are engaged in, develop, in, in um, producing biological control organisms very cheaply, but the whole enterprise is engaging women to produce bi uh, biological control organisms that then produce, uh, distributed to farms. So there's a multitude of ways. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, actually, for agroecology, I think to some extent it's related to the relationship between agriculture and the eco-environment. Uh, however, I wonder about how human beings can benefit from eco-agroecology eco, um, and uh, why farmers should follow the agroecology. Thank you. Um, well, the, the answer to both those questions is, this, is pretty much the same. By, work, by, uh, by turning your farm into an agroecological farm, you are improving the, the um, quality of the environment, the, the health of the soils, you're improving your yields, you're reducing your costs, um, and producing healthier food. And those are the, those are, and also making it more resilient to climate change. So, so when the droughts, if the, if the rains don't come for three weeks and you have no water to, to water your plants, agroecological plants can withstand that much better than a, those that are based on on soil conditions where you've added nitrogen fertilizer or phosphate fertilizer, and there's no life in the soil to sustain the plants. There's no there's no organic matter to hold the moisture in the soils and to keep the microorganisms working. So. Those kind of techniques will enable the, actually helping farmers to get through difficult periods when they might otherwise lose their crops, and with agroecology they don't lose them. Uh, how, how can we uh, expand public support for agroecology? Uh, for example, you know, how, how do we uh, convince consumers uh, you mentioned about uh, some health benefits for women, but are there other else? And also in terms of the price, are, are products produced through agroecological farming cheaper and things like that? That's a difficult question. Um, in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of urban consumers, the only visibility for agroecology is um, organic, certified organic product. Uh, so pe people can see that. Uh, and they can buy it. Uh, there is no way that we can make, at the moment, there's not, there's not really much way in which urban consumers uh, are aware of what's grown agroecologically or not, unless they buy through farmers markets. And, 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 um, in many countries now, and particularly in my own, for example, we have farmers markets that are coming right into the city. So consumers can go directly to a farmers market. They, they can meet the farmer that's growing the food. They can see um, where the foods come from and they can, be, they can have trust in that grower. Um, there are things like community supported agricultural schemes in the US and a number of other countries where farmers develop relationships directly with consumers. And those consumers know where their food comes from and they can see the process. In terms of making it um, well known at a, at a wider community level, we have, we have a lot of work to do there yet. We have a lot of... Uh, 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 consumers are not generally aware of that term yet and we need to explain it more to consumers to help them to understand that food grown using agroecology is helping them, helping the farmers, helping the communities and helping the environment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, if there is no other questions or comment today, let's uh, finish this motion. Thank you very much.